Hi, I'm Kevin Daniel, uh, longtime assistant coach of Roy Simmons. Uh, I'd like to start just by saying hi to Roy. Uh, haven't seen you in a while. Hope all is well. I miss you. A um, couple of things about Roy. Uh, I, first thing, I have to thank him for everything he's done for me. Uh, first, uh, asking me to play for him. Uh, the experience that I had as a player, you know, like everybody who's played for him, was incredible. Um, there's no place, no person that you would rather play for, believe me. Um, I thank him again for taking a chance on a, a high school JV coach and offering him an assistant job. And then once there, allowing me to experiment, have successes and failures, and, and keep mentoring me along, along the way. Um, forever thankful for that, and just an incredible experience. I thank you for that. Um, a lot of things to remember about Roy. He was a, he was a, he was a groundbreaker. He did a lot of things that were different from other coaches that other coaches could learn from. Um, he believed in teaching his players culture. When when teams uh, went on the road and you know practice was over, they sent them back to the hotel to re rack or whatever. Roy made his kids go to museums. He brought them to museums to let kids see culture. He, what I think he was really letting them see was greatness. He was always uh, against people just dabbling in things. Roy expected and wanted his players and people around him to try to be great. And by showing them these works of art, these incredible things of wonder, you just almost had to uh, see that what Roy was trying to teach you was don't be afraid to be great. Expect it. His messages were, were often in his speeches. And when I was a player, we actually called them semi-speeches. They would take place any time, any place, any length of time, usually very long. Uh, if it was at practice, it would start with players, after a while, a couple of them taking a knee and maybe unbuckling their chin strap. Uh, after a while longer, some guys would be sitting down and other guys on their knee. By the time it was over, uh, everybody's on the ground, helmets off, but why we were listening. Uh, you, you gave us a lot to chew on in those in those speeches. You were building confidence with us, uh, common thinking. You were encouraging us to be creative and play in a style that other people were afraid to play in. And um, for that, I'm thankful. Uh, the speeches that took place um, pre-game, uh, I had a problem with. And the problem was I was an assistant coach. And he would let us do our X's and O's before. And then when he came in to speak, uh, he would start going. And I, the problem I had was I had to leave. I had to go take the goalies out. So my job was to look at my watch, listen to Roy, look at my watch, and then kind of time it to when I saw him catch a, a pause in his breath, which sometimes was difficult to do. Um, but when I did, I would then just simply say, goalies. And the goalies would stand. Um, all the players would cheer the goalies. And then we would leave. And then Roy would continue on with his speech. And I'd be out warming the goalies up in any length of time, two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes. Finally, the music would come on, and you know what that music is. And the players would literally charge onto the field. And I knew I'd missed something in the end of the meeting, the, uh, the speech that he was telling. And as I got older, I realized I needed to hear these. I wanted to hear these. So the goalie warm-ups got shorter and shorter until one day uh, we were playing Princeton in the Dome. It was an uh, early season game. Princeton had won the national championship the year before. Uh, they were ranked number one, deservedly, and we weren't. Roy, I think, realized that this team needed a little bit of confidence and a little bit of push. His speech began that day in the pregame about a young fisherman. And we're getting ready to play Princeton. And when he said, I'm going to talk about a young fisherman, I knew the goalies weren't going to get a very long warm-up that day. I had to hear this one. His message was, was simple, and it was classic Roy. This fisherman didn't want to just be good. He wanted to be great. Common message with Roy. And when every other fisherman went out, they would go to the left, go fishing where the fish were, catch their fish, throwing them into their holding tanks, and the fish would know they were caught. They would kind of lose their life, sense of life, and, and they'd bring them back, and these fish were good. They were good to eat. He had one good to eat. He wanted to be the best. So when he went out and everybody went left, he went to the right. He went to where he could catch a shark, a predator. 
He caught the shark and he put it into the tank. Then he went to the left to go fishing. Now when he caught fish, he would put him into the tank with the predator. These fish had a choice, swim for their life or die. And these fish, when they brought back to market, were the best fish anybody's ever tasted. The message was about the predator and how you need one. And that's how he ended his story. He pointed to the exit door where we had to leave to go to the field. And he said, there's a predator out there waiting for you. And you need that predator. And the team cheered, out we went. We won that day. I don't know if it was because of the predator. Uh, we were pretty good. And so was Princeton. It was a great game. But a classic example on how Roy thought outside the box. It's consistent with his with his themes, though. And he turned young boys into men. There's no doubt about that. Thank you, Roy, for the experiences. Again, hope you're well. See you soon.